Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our forum. It's great to see so many people out here on a Saturday morning. Uh, never doubt the uh, commitment to uh, good government and community in uh, Davis and in uh, Yolo County. Uh, this is a uh, educational forum in which we have uh, invited the uh, three declared candidates for our assembly district, uh, fourth district seat. Uh, the candidates, and I will introduce them a little later, are uh, Bill Dodd, Joe Cravosa, and Dan Wolk. But I'd like to begin uh, by introducing the uh, board of directors of the YOLO Healthy Aging Alliance, uh, a sponsor of this event. Uh, I'm the chair of the Aging Alliance. Uh, the vice chair is uh, Peggy Goldstein. Uh, and feel free to stand up. Uh, Alyssa Meyer, uh, secretary. This is uh, Peggy. Uh, Don Myers Perkey, Fran Smith, Joan Beasley, Davis Campbell, Connie Caldwell, Alyssa Sykes, and uh, Sheila Allen, the Executive Director. Thank you very much for your role in setting up this forum. And I would also like to uh, represent the chair of our uh, co-sponsor, uh, Francis Grace Child, who's chair of the In-Home Supportive Services uh, Advisory Committee. There's Francis. Uh, by way of a uh, brief introduction, uh, in uh, 2010, we held an aging summit. And the reason we did that is we looked at some very interesting numbers that uh, uh, Assemblywoman uh, Yamada, our current uh, assembly member, uh, referred to as the tsunami of seniors because the numbers as the baby boomers age that will be going into what we ha have referred to as a senior citizen status, which is uh, a fluid age group now because 60s is the new 50s and I'm not sure exactly when it starts, but uh, there's a lot of us. And in fact, uh, the uh, projection of a 300% uh, increase between 2000 and 2040 of the age uh, 60 and older population, a 500% increase in the population 85 above, and a 1,500% increase in uh, people over 100 years of age. So that, I, I think, demonstrates a need for some planning. Now, it's a good thing for people in my generation approaching uh, 60, uh, because it means we're gonna live longer. That's, a, that's good news. But the, uh, the possible crisis is that uh, it is going to strain all of our services. When Social Security was first adopted, uh, age 65 was life expectancy. Now, now we're going to have increasing numbers of people uh, living uh, into their 80s and 90s. So we have to make sure that the services are there, that the housing's there, that the nutrition's there, and that, uh, that whatever people's benefits are for retirement last through those years. So that's why we, uh, we formed the, uh, we did the Aging Summit and, and we looked at various uh, gaps in services, uh, uh, needs uh, for uh, planning in our community, in the areas of transportation, in the areas of nutrition, housing, and uh, need for advocacy in terms of those services. And one of the things we did was form the Healthy Aging Alliance, which is a nonprofit, uh, but it is a combination of uh, government officials. It will be headed uh, permanently by whoever the fourth district supervisor is to, to maintain that connection to county government. And it includes members of the various social service agencies on the county level, but also the nonprofits coming together regularly uh, to collaborate, uh, to uh, recognize a need for advocacy, and to uh, plan for the services as we move ahead uh, in the 21st century. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, introduce a, uh, our executive director, Sheila Allen, who is going to do a brief uh, slide presentation uh, on what we determined uh, to be some of the needs in the communities, and then we will move on to the forum in about 10 minutes. Sheila? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. It's always great when you have a party and people show up. So I'm really happy to see all your faces out there. Um, a couple of things before I begin. I want to thank Dawn Myers Perky and her wonderful Sac State and UC Davis interns who are helping us this morning. So if we could thank them. <laughs> and then as a reminder, we do have some really lovely food over there. And it was sponsored by Palm Garden Senior Living in Woodland. So we do appreciate their support on that. 
So with that being said, I'll launch into my PowerPoint. Um, the, we, our tagline is that we are the unified voice for older adults in Yolo County. So next slide, please. So if I push it again. Here they come, that's what Jim was talking about, the silver tsunami. So um, as a reminder, so by 2013, there's going to be 72.1 million older Americans in the United States. Next slide. So the silver tsunami, and these are the, this is just a graphical presentation of what Jim was talking about. And the, if you can't see those numbers so carefully, the blue line on the top is the numbers of those over 60. The red line is those over 65, and the bottom line is those over 85. And the key thing to see is that good for us that we're living longer, but there's many, many more people that are gonna be thinking about healthy aging issues. Next slide. So in Yolo County, uh, in, in 2010 right now, our population is around 200,000, and about 10% of those people are over 65. But by the year 2050, about 22% of the people are going to be 65. So not only a larger number, but also a larger percentage of the population. Next slide. And uh, as Jim said, when we, had, when we decided to have the first summit, it was a combination of this silver tsunami and the concern about what was happening with programs because of the Great Recession. So we had the, the summit that he talked about already, and um, so the one thing that I wanna say about it is that um, I was hired to run the program, and I did some background work and found that in Yolo County, first of all, is really great about um, providing senior services. There are many pockets of different nonprofits, for-profits, community-based organizations, and government entities that provide services. Um, so there's been an interest in senior issues for a long time, and when I did the research on it, I found that 10 years before 2010, there was a task force that looked at senior issues and, and came up with some recommendations. And 10 years before that, there was a task force that looked into it, there's somebody who's on it, that, that, looked, in, that looked into it. The, but the problem was they, they identified the problems, but nothing was done. But what happened differently this time is that we identified what the problems were, and there was so much enthusiasm that day that we said it's not going to stop here, it's not going on the shelf. So we, the YOLO Healthy Aging Alliance was born to help to move these issues forward. Next. So this is our mission statement. The YOLO Healthy Aging Alliance promotes the well-being of older adults through education, collaboration and advocacy. Next. And um, we have our original funding from the SCAN Foundation and that's really a great fit for us because their tagline or the thing that they're concerned about is making sure that everyone can age with dignity, choice and independence. Uh -huh. And because of this grant, we not only are able to fund our local efforts, but now we're connected to other aging alliance throughout the state of California. So our two main committees are the Advocacy Committee, and we have a whole process that we go through to identify what will be our area of focus for the fiscal year. And so our areas of focus for this fiscal year are first, the effects of sequestration cuts on local services. And just as an example, you may have been reading in the paper and there was recently a fundraiser for our countywide, it's called Elderly Nutrition Program, ENP here, but that's our local Meals on Wheels. So there have been real cuts to real programs that affect real people. So as a local advocacy committee, we are trying to make sure that elected officials understand what effect that has on the ground here. Another area of interest for us, and this might be where candidates might be taking notes, <laughs> is that we're really interested in looking at what are mental health issues um, for services for seniors, because there are really some gaps in services there. And um, next is the in-home supportive services cuts. So for those of you who don't know, in-home supportive services is a Medi-Cal program, and that provides in-home care for um, older persons and persons with disabilities. They're evaluated and they're given a certain number of hours for some help so they're able to stay independently in their home. And finally, is to make sure that we are ahead of the curve on the rollout of the dual eligibles. And some of you may have been at the YOLO Healthy Aging Alliance had a forum on the duals. And for those of you who don't know what a dual is, <laughs> it's people who have both Medi-Cal and Medicare. So there is a movement state, statewide to have people who have both Medicare and Medi-Cal to go it, to have managed care. And um, there are 10 pilot counties, and Yolo County is not one of them. So if you have, it's not happening right here now, but there is a pilot, and it is currently the intent of the state to have that roll into all the counties. 
So those 10, we wish them luck because it's been really an interesting road for them, but they're the pilot ones and we are really trying to do all the planning ahead of time so that when it does come to Yolo County, we are already set. We'll learn from their issues and we'll have made all those connections ahead of time. Next. Our other committee is the Collaboration Committee, and this is really an exciting group. Well, the other one's exciting too, but what's really exciting about the Collaboration Committee is that it started with seven providers of senior services in 2010. We're now up to 46 um, organizations, both public, private, non-private, faith community, government providers, all who provide services for seniors. And the, we meet once a month, and as the name says, that's what we do. It's all about collaboration. So we have an annual cross training where we go around the room and each of the organizations say, here are the services we provide, here's how you do the referrals to us. And the other thing that we did is we made, we created an adult referral form so that we can more easily be able to refer between these organizations. So as what we was found in the previous evaluations and at the summit, that we were finding that some of the gaps in services were really much more gaps in information. So that either the individuals or other organizations didn't know about Meals on Wheels or in-home support services or the Davis Community Church and the kind of things that they do. So it's really getting what our, the, the phrase that I'm really grasping onto and I think is great is that our goal is to get the right service to the people at the right time. So this is our website. This is another great thing that has come out of the YOLO Healthy Aging Alliance. And um, this is just a screenshot of one part of it, but the great thing for both providers and for people in the community that I, that I really like about it is the resource tab over on the right. That's the one that's highlighted. And so I had a UC Davis intern that went around and, and made sure that we had all, as many resources as possible. And then you can see the sample here of food resources, and this is the Elderly Nutrition Program. There's a brief description of what it is, their phone number, and then a live link to their website. So it's a listing of the resources for transportation, food, mental health, in-home care, and support services, um, and information and referral services. Next. So that's www.yellowhealthyaging.org, or Google us. So here's the gaps in services. So this UC Davis student also went out and did um, interviews with many um, of the providers and some community members to find out what are the current gaps in service. So this is the part also where you might be taking notes. So here's some of the gaps in services that have been identified and we've already made some strides in trying to uh, address these. So there are currently five million services that are, five million seniors, excuse me, who are experiencing food insecurity and there's also very low CalFresh, that's the local term for the food stamp program, very low participation by seniors um, California-wide, but in particular, um, Yolo County is one of the lowest. So we're trying to address that. And how that, the, the, so those are the, the gaps, and then the additional areas of, of gaps are the sequestration cuts I already talked about, that we have a very diverse county, we have sort of urban areas, we have farm communities, and we do have a long stretch of, of rural areas that need to have um, the access to services. And that we need more volunteers in order to try to get these food services out to people. Um, next is transportation services, and this here, the uh, statistic that, that my um, intern found is that people outlive their ability to safely drive by eight years, so it's important to do the assessment about when it's time to give up the keys, and if you give up the keys, how are you gonna get from where you, where you are to where you wanna be? So we have to make sure those are in place. And about one third of seniors experience transportation deficiency. So, so kind of teasing out what does that mean for transportation? It's about the availability of the service. It's about the travel time, because it's not just like hopping in your car and going somewhere, you have to call and make the appointment, you have to wait for them to pick you up, you have to wait for them to pick you back up again. If you're taking the bus, it's the time waiting at the station, at the, the bus stop, so travel time. And then fear or lack of knowledge of public transportation. Next. Mental health gaps, this is something that we were particularly working on this year. We had a forum on this in December also. And just a statistic that the number of Americans age 65 or older who have mental health or substance abuse orders currently, this is nationwide, not in Yolo County, um, is 5.6 to 8 million people. 
And in 2013, it'll be projected 10.1 to 14.4. And when we're thinking about mental health issues, there's not, there are people who come into the aging experience with existing mental health issues, there are some who develop mental health issues, and then there are some dementia-related issues also all layered on top of there. So areas of gaps in services related to mental health are budget cuts, there's underrepresentation of minorities that are receiving care, there's reductions in staff and programs. I don't know if people know about this, but there's really an epidemic in elderly suicide that the, um, particularly older men are more likely to be successful when they attempt suicide. So we do have a program that I can talk about another time, a friendship line to try to, to help that, but an important issue that a lot of people don't know about. Um, there is no geriatric psychiatrist in Yolo County, but that's something that we're also trying to address soon and that there's limited providers that take insurance because the um, reimbursement is still very low. Next. So elder abuse and fraud. One in 10 adult will uh, experience abuse of some sort, and only one in 14 elder abuse cases are ever reported. So, and, and also in 2010, seniors lost, this is nationwide, $2.9 billion in the financial, from financial abuse. And often, the victim knows the perpetrator. So some additional issues around elder abuse and senior fraud is that there's um, the number, the sheer volume of that needs to be addressed for this at the uh, Adult Protective Services. That's kind of the correlate of this Child Protective Services. Adult Protective Services has, the need is much greater than the number of people we have to be able to address it. Um, the issue of ER and hospital revolving door, so somebody um, goes into the hospital, has an issue, and they're, all the, um, the community resources aren't put together so that they end up going back into the hospital again, and that's not just related to senior fraud and abuse, but other areas also. Um, and this is an interesting one that I hadn't thought about before my a student went out and talked to the, people, the providers for um, Adult Protective Services, is the early release program for prisoners, that that has, um, they come home and they're looking for some place to live or they're looking for some money and they're looking to relatives or people that they don't know and there's financial and other kinds of abuse associated with that. Um, there's uh, insufficient legal services for seniors and uh, again, many cases of abuse fraud go unreported. So conclusions. Well here, by the way, anyone who thinks that they're not aging in here, we're all aging. That's why we call ourselves the YOLO Healthy Aging Alliance, where it's not just for seniors, it's about the whole aging process. And I don't think there's anybody in here, no matter what your age, who would argue against the need for healthy aging. And just to remember about that, really the focus of, of, of our organization, and hopefully the community, is making sure that people get the right service at the right time. And that doesn't always mean spending more money. It's often about just getting the information to people and that many of these gaps can be addressed by just working together. Next slide, oh, there's one more slide yet. There we are, so um, this is just upcoming events. So we haven't set the date yet, but we will be having a follow-up summit since it's been three years since we had our last one, almost four now. Um, so watch for the date for that. Um, Congressman Garamendi had said that he'll be our uh, lunchtime speaker, so we are w checking with his scheduling people, but it will be sometime this spring. And then if you're interested in the work of the YOLO Healthy Aging Alliance, or you'd just like to be in our email list, when you came in, if you provided your email, then I'll check in with you about that. So that's the end of it then. All right. <laughs> okay, thanks. So now I just want to tell you about the, um, about the cards. When you came in, there was a card on your seat. So if you would like to ask a question of the candidates, you can um, write the question on the card and raise your hand, and we have runners who will come pick them up. And we'll also have a live mic if you prefer to be somebody who is able to articulate your own question. So now we'll throw it back to Jim. Thank you, Sheila. I'll invite the candidates to come up to the table. I did want to thank uh, our three candidates for actually taking up the task of running for a state assembly. Having just run for a county supervisor, I know how very difficult it is, and uh, I'm not sure how many people know it, but this district is huge. It covers uh, several counties. Uh, it, it's almost a, a, a full-time occupation just getting around in the district. So I so, uh, really appreciate all three candidates uh, for uh, being willing to run and uh, offer it to serve us. I think we're very fortunate to have such uh, uh, great individuals running for office. 
Uh, we're going to begin, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce each candidate and give them five minutes to introduce themselves. Uh, three to five minutes, they don't have to talk to the whole, for the whole five, but our timekeeper will uh, get very upset if they go over the five minutes. <laughs> then after that, I'm going to ask a general question to get, to, to, to get the question started, and then we will follow by, uh, at, by asking questions from the cards, or if I see someone at the microphone, I'll also uh, call on the person at the microphone to ask a question. Uh, we did a, uh, a drawing, a lottery, to determine uh, first through third speaker. Uh, and uh, we were, will reverse that order at the end for concluding remarks, which will again be uh, three to five minutes. Our uh, first uh, candidate who won the lottery is uh, Dan Wolk. Uh, Dan has served on the Davis City Council since 2011. Uh, voters returned him to the council in 2012 with more votes than any other candidate in Davis's history. Uh, as a city council member, he's led efforts to adopt the surface water project. He's pushed for greater investments in the city's roads and bike paths, and he's explored uh, sustainable energy initiatives. Uh, Dan is deputy county council uh, for Solano County, uh, handling public finance, public contracting, and water issues. He's also the co-founder of the Legal Clinic of Yolo County, a legal services provider for low-income families. Uh, Dan grew up in Davis and attended Davis Public Schools. Uh, he earned his undergraduate degree from Stan Stanford University and attended uh, UC Davis uh, King Hall School of Law. Uh, he lives in, in, in Davis uh, with his oh. wife. Uh, pardon? I'm sorry. Berkeley. 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 I wanted you to go to UC it Davis. Book. It does, yeah. <laughs> I, I was trying to do part of it from memory and then I uh, slipped into Joe's. So, uh, <laughs> But uh, the Bolt Hook School of Law, oh, yeah, it's an aging thing, yeah. <laughs> uh, he lives in Davis with his wife and children, and uh, uh, very happy to have him here as a candidate for state assembly. Dan? Thank you, Jim, and, and King Hall is a wonderful place to go to school with him. Uh, his but, uh, father teaches, though, at yes. King Hall, that's it. And you're a graduate. But, uh, yeah. but thank you to the YOLO a Healthy Aging Alliance for, for hosting this. Uh, it, it's wonderful and it's nice to see a lot of familiar faces in the audience including my father-in-law Will Eiley who is probably hating the fact that I'm announcing him but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but thanks for going into my bio Jim and uh, just to elaborate a little bit because I, I work a lot in the issues that that um, that we're talking about today a lot of these elderly issues first with respect to the clinic and I'd just like to know Lisa Meyer who's, who's back here with the board and also Lane Roberts Muster were also very influential with that clinic and helpful we set it up actually in the West Sacramento Senior Center. And actually, uh, it lives on essentially there. And so a lot of the issues that we dealt with were uh, senior issues, were elder abuse issues, and I'll get into those uh, later. Also, as a deputy county counsel for the county of Solano, a lot of what Sheila talked about, those are county issues. That's where, really where the rubber hits the road in terms of, of services to be provided and the disinvestment that we've seen. And, um, so I work a lot in the area of IHSS, I work a lot in the area of APS, do a lot of help uh, with the DA in terms of elder abuse issues. So I'm very familiar with these issues and work, work often in, with, in, in these issues, and I'll get into that in a little bit. As a council member, I've also been a strong advocate for these issues, okay? And part of that's personal, um, in that my grandmother, who's no longer with us, uh, unfortunately, um, she, uh, she did uh, come to Davis from Florida to live here, and we dealt with the assisted uh, living uh, facility situation, which uh, I hope we get into. She was low income, and we, we dealt with, um, with the difficulty that many of you, I'm sure, have, have faced with, with your loved ones uh, with, with dealing with that system, and I hope to get into that. Um, and, uh, and, but also, uh, you know, in terms of my record on the council, just uh, there's a number of issues. I'll just uh, tease out two of them first, is that I, along with two of my colleagues, Council Member Swanson and Council Member Frerichs, um, approved the cannery project, really led, led the effort on the cannery project. And that project is the most advanced, universally designed project in this nation. It has the Escaton seal of approval, which is wonderful. And thanks to the help of the good folks at CHA, it has a, a, an even greater amount of single story units, which is very critical. Um, so I'm very, very proud of that project. Second of all is uh, I help with, uh, with Council Member Swanson in developing a program utilizing federal home funds uh, to uh, develop a program uh, to uh, essentially help homeowners 
uh, rehab their, um, their exi you know, allow them to age in place, rehab their existing uh, structures um, to, you know, to, to provide for those things that, uh, that universal design within Canary will provide, but we don't have that in our existing houses. Uh, anyway, um, there's a number of things I hope to get to them that we need to do in terms of elderly, uh, elderly issues, and a lot of those were touched upon. First, we need to incorporate universal design into our building code. Second is that there has been an immense amount of disinvestment, and that's a, the essence of why I'm running. There's been an immense amount of disinvestment in our state, and at the federal level and state level. And for years, California, the state government has been, has been such a strong investor in terms of our people and our institutions. But just years of disinvestment, predating even the Great Recession, um, has, has really put uh, people in, in, in peril. And you really see that in these issues uh, in, in, with respect to seniors. And a lot of those were touched upon. But I see it as a, uh, at, at the county level, I see it at the city level, I see it at the personal level. You see IHSS getting cut, you see, um, you see the district attorneys, you see the attorney general, you see uh, legal services in Northern California, other legal entities not having the resources to go after elder abuse. So you, that's, exact, that's the essence of why I'm running, because we really need to disinvest. Third is that we need a, gr to a greater regulation of our assisted living facilities. I think that's critical. I witnessed that personally. And we need to build more of those facilities to, you know, to, because as has been said, we have this silver tsunami coming. It's the fastest growing cohort, um, certainly in Davis and, and in the state. Um, we need to also, at the federal level, restore these cuts that have, have taken place to CalFresh, to, you know, to food stamps, um, and uh, you know, the sequestration. And you can really see that in Meals on Wheels, in that it's so difficult to provide services to rural seniors. And those sequestration cuts have really hit that. And that's the type of reinvestment that we need. So I hope to get into a lot more of these uh, as the discussion goes on. I'm happy to be here, but that's the essence of who I am, and that's the essence of why I'm running, and uh, I would love your support. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dan. And our, our next uh, candidate is uh, Mayor Joe Cravosa. Uh, Joe was elected to the Davis City Council in 2010 and has served as mayor of Davis since 2011. Uh, Joe has worked to develop relationships between the city of Davis, local business communities, and UC Davis to boost economic uh, development and help create jobs, including uh, key early support to Davis Roots, a nonprofit startup uh, business accelerator. Uh, Joe is a lifelong environmentalist. He led the Puta Creek Council for seven years where he worked to restore the creek's historic salmon. For these efforts, Joe received Davis's Environmental Recognition Award in 2001. Joe's a strong advocate for open space uh, and wildlife protection, and he's also an avid uh, utility bicycle advocate. Uh, Joe grew up in Pasadena and received his undergraduate degree from Occidental College. In 1991, Joe and his wife Janet moved to Davis, and Joe attended law school at UC Davis. He's worked as an environmental lawyer specializing in water law uh, before joining UC Davis in 1996 to start the UCD Institute of Transportation Study and its Energy Efficiency Center. Uh, Joe and Janet raised two daughters who attended Davis Public Schools. Joe? Very good. Uh, thank you, Jim. And also, of course, thank you for the, uh, thank you to the YOLO Healthy Aging Alliance. Uh, and it's, it's great to be here today. We, we're all getting after these forums. This is wonderful to meet so many people. And I guess I'd echo a little bit of Jim's comments at the beginning just about the, you know, the amazing process of meeting the people that would like to serve you. And certainly I'd like to continue my service for all of you. Uh, so as uh, Jim mentioned, uh, Janet and I, and Janet's here. I wanted to introduce Janet. Janet, thank you for, for showing up and coming out. Uh, it's my wife. We've raised our two daughters here in Davis. Uh, now one of the daughters is off in Nashville as a teacher, and the other one is a junior in college down in Southern California. Uh, but uh, I've, been your, I've been your mayor here since early uh, 2011. It's been my pleasure to really roll up my sleeves and work on kind of big issue after big issue after big issue uh, that we've had in this city. And so from the, uh, from the water project to the, uh, the cannery development to uh, getting our budget in order and figuring out how we take care of all our employee long-term uh, liabilities, uh, it's been my pleasure to, uh, to kind of take my experience in life and extend it uh, forward into this uh, community. 
Uh, I've been very proud to make incredibly strong alliances between UC Davis and the city. I think we've had a renaissance in that, both in planning and in shared services that speak to how we do government uh, with a little bit less and a little bit more creativity. Uh, one of the strengths that I'll bring to the assembly is the, the fantastic resources of the University of California. The University of California is the research arm of the state of California, and my day job is all about taking the energy and environmental lessons of UC Davis uh, and extending them uh, out into society. And I've done that at the city, and I certainly look forward to doing that uh, as I go into the legislature, but not just in the area of energy and transportation, but really in the, the great work of, of aging and gerontology and so on that's also going on uh, at UC Davis, and certainly agriculture is another experience there. Uh, I do want to note that one of the, the episodes of this campaign that's been very profound on me was uh, in June, after I announced in, in early May, uh, Janet's parents uh, began struggling tremendously with how they juggled between their uh, in-home support services uh, down in the Bay Area and moving up to Davis and moving into an assisted living facility. Uh, and you know that tells us that these issues of seniors, they're all gonna affect all of us, but they also affect our families and they affect caregivers. So we really have this triumvirate of people involved in this uh, that we have to uh, take uh, great care of. Uh, one of the other options, and, and they actually moved up to Davis, they moved into assisted living, and they found that it didn't work for them, and they moved back down to the Bay Area, back down into their home so they could age in place. So uh, dealing with all the finances and all the trials of that is something I understand kind of very, very uh, profoundly and very first uh, firsthand. Uh, I also want to recognize that as, as mayor, uh, I have not necessarily been dealing with the statewide issues. I've studied them quite a bit, and we'll get to them in the Q&A. But I have been dealing with senior issues kind of right here on the ground in the community. And we're sitting here in the Davis Senior Center, right? And that's a fantastic example of how a community can create a space that brings everybody together. Uh, and that can be part of the backbone of how we serve our seniors. And so here in this very building, we've had our transit workshops uh, that I've been part of, always speaking at them to make sure that seniors know what their transit options are within the community. Uh, we've created this Connections Cafe to bring seniors together to share their uh, different challenges uh, and, and issues. And so here we have the SCAN Foundation putting up the funds to help the Yolo Healthy Aging Alliance move forward. And that kind of tells me that a little bit of private money with a strong mission that brings us all together and puts the information down that we're all gonna need to manage seniors in the future can be tremendously powerful. So I look forward to taking my experience as your mayor uh, in a broad, broad set of areas, the connections to campus and all the things that we've worked on forward and to serving all of you. So I'd like to uh, look forward to your support and look forward to learning from all of you. Thank you, Joe. Must be uh, Assembly Member Yamada. <laughs> <laughs> Our next uh, candidate is uh, Bill Dodd. Now, Bill comes to us from uh, the Napa County Board of Sur uh, Supervisors, where he has served since March 2000. Uh, he continues to serve as a supervisor, and he represents the cities and the County of Napa on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and recently served a two-year term as the chair of that commission. He's been a member of the uh, Justin Siena High School Board of Trustees, and he has also served as chair of the Local Agency Formation Commission of Napa County, the Napa County League of Governments, the Napa County Transportation Planning Agency, and the Napa County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. Bill graduated from Justin Siena High School and from the California State University at Chico. He went on to own and operate a Culligan Water operation, and during this time, Bill also served in the community as president of uh, national and state trade associations, the Water Quality Association, and the Pacific Water Quality Association. Uh, Bill was honored in 2014 by the Napa Chamber of Commerce as its citizens, uh, Citizen of the Year. Bill? Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, and thank you to the uh, Yolo uh, County Healthy Aging Alliance. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here today. During this campaign so far, we've talked a lot about 
uh, labor, we've talked a lot about democratic issues, we've talked about ag, we've talked about the environment, but we really haven't given the focused attention and time uh, to senior issues, to elder issues, and uh, as the senior citizen in this group of candidates, uh, I think it's high time that we do that. We're doing that right here in Yolo County, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to do that. Uh, I do have a passion for this. It was interesting that the, the statistic on the, uh, on the slide said that in Yolo County, the 10% were 65. I assume that was 65 and older, but yet the number statewide is much higher. It's over 20%. And in the, over the next 20 years, that is going to more than double. So the problems that uh, my uh, <coughs> colleagues on, uh, on this panel accurately pointed out about senior issues moving forward are going to be more critical as we move as we move on. And waiting until that happens, I think, is, is disastrous. And we need to get action now. We need to start restoring these cuts and get get the help to our our seniors that they need, uh, want, and deserve. In Napa County, as chairman of the board in 2006, uh, the Board of Supervisors, we instituted a new policy which put one supervisor in every Commission on Aging meeting every single month. This gave the opportunity for our board members to be in a Commission on Aging meeting a minimum of two times, and in some cases three times uh, a year. In addition to that, we started seeing that some of these issues were coming up uh, and we, you know, waiting for an annual report from our Commission on Aging seemed a little bit, uh, um, it wasn't enough. And so we've asked them and they have done it twice a year, twice annually, we will have a report from our Commission on Aging to our Board of Supervisors. And we really have found that that has kept us really clearly more in touch with our seniors and the issues that they face on a daily basis. One of the things that we've been able to do uh, as a county board is uh, we are the only county out of 58 counties in the state of California that has a license program with background checks for caregivers of anybody that offers care to senior citizens. I'm very proud of that because uh, when we first came to the Board of Supervisors, we turned it down. I think it was probably around 2006. And the reason why we turned it down was quite simple. This is a state you know, program. None of the other counties were doing it. And for heaven's sakes, uh, why should this fall on the County Board of Supervisors? Well, let me tell you, my appointee to the Commission on Aging was not impressed, was not happy one single bit, and uh, she just happens to be my ex-mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let me tell you, uh, we had some conversations and we came back at it a different way. And they asked for two members of the Board of Supervisors to come and sit on the committee that had just spent, uh, you know, maybe 26 weeks or so, half a year, on formulating this recommendation to the Board of Supervisors that we turned down. So uh, myself and Supervisor Dillon sat on that committee and all of a sudden, things began to make a little bit more sense. When you start hearing, and it's easy to have the, you know, the, the statistics on a board, but when you're sitting there and you're talking to the DA, and the DA is telling you about cases that you, we have in our own com a community, and some of the details that he has that nobody else had or they didn't want to put up on the board during the board of supervisors meetings, all of a sudden we got the, we, we understood the issue and my colleague, uh, Diane Dillon, and I worked tirelessly, and we brought within, I think it was another three months, back to the Board of Supervisors, a proposal that we passed 5-0 to provide uh, licensing uh, and background checks for anybody that works with senior citizens in our community. And I'm telling you, it's a, it's a model, and apparently, uh, it's my understanding that Assembly Member Yamada is doing a fantastic job in this area, and she's taking that as a model to the state, which it needs to be. I mean, it shouldn't be just people from Napa County that have those type of protect protections. Every senior needs and should have those protections. But moving along, I kind of met in preparation for this event with some uh, seniors that, uh, um, that I've uh, become very, very familiar with over the years and worked with, you know, tirelessly, and, you know, just, you know, what are the things that are important to seniors and what are the things that 
we really can do as a government to make sure that we're moving the ball in the right direction, so to speak. And clearly what happened is, and we came up with California should have the capacity to serve our seniors with fluid access to a variety of services necessary to maintain independence and live in the least restrictive environment. The question that becomes, uh, you know, what does a healthy community look like, you know, when it's with regard to senior citizens? And I think when you get to this, it kind of spells out where we need to be and why these uh, cuts that have been made need to be, uh, you know, fixed immediately. Uh, so a healthy community looks like this, is when seniors are valued and afforded every opportunity for choice in living conditions. Where care and housing that offers dignity and least restricted living, I've mentioned that. Where all caregivers are licensed, and we're gonna get there. And all facilities have meaningful oversight, appropriate services, and caregivers. And finally, where seniors know and understand those, their rights, and then have an expectation that those rights are gonna be enforced. There you go. And that is not happening today, and we need to make sure that that enforcement is an integral part of whatever program that is put in place uh, for our seniors. So in closing, I, I do really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm a, I believe, tireless act, activist for seniors in Napa County. And um, I feel like I am the, uh, certainly, I'm, as I said on the top of the uh, talk, that I am the senior citizen. <laughs> but I'm also the most experienced. And I've got 14 years in government with significant accomplishments that uh, my colleagues and I have performed over those years. And then finally, uh, I think that my 25 years of business experience also adds to that whole experience level to go to Sacramento, roll up my sleeves, and get things done for the people of the state of California. So I appreciate your time and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Bill. We're gonna go into the uh, questions now, but we're gonna start with a, a general question uh, that I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit out of order to give everybody a chance to go first, second, and third. Uh, the first question is, uh, uh, what would you do uh, as an assembly member uh, to assure that the needs of seniors are met in the state of California and in our community. I'll start with uh, Joe. Well, I think that, uh, what, what's the time on this? Two minutes. Just two minutes. So there, there are four areas that I see where we wanna focus our attention for seniors. Uh, the first is, first is housing, the second is health care. Uh, the third is long-term uh, care, and the fourth I think is transportation and, uh, and independence. So to give you, uh, some of the ideas uh, that I've been talking to people about uh, in the area of uh, housing, uh, as was mentioned, we approved universal design for cannery. I do want to say that I held out on the cannery vote at the end because of a safety issue, and I didn't feel that the developer was adequately addressing safety in the project. Uh, but I was certainly fully supportive of the universal design and our senior citizen commission recommending that uh, unanimously. I think we need tax credits uh, and deductions for home modifications to help people uh, be able to age in place. Uh, absolutely, universal design should be more universally accepted. Uh, we should have more options for middle income seniors. Uh, wealthy seniors are doing fine. Those seniors that are on Medi-Cal and Medicare are fine, but we need to look at more options for middle income seniors. And I also think we need more support for more flexible transit-oriented uh, developments that help seniors live closer to where they're gonna shop and have their different uh, interactions with the community. In terms of uh, long-term care, uh, we really have a major piece of legislation moving forward, a major act moving forward in the legislature now. This is this residential care facilities for elderly reform. Uh, this is exactly the kind of serious regulation uh, that we need in the area of, of, of senior uh, long-term care to make sure people are uh, protected. Uh, moving into health care, I'm a very strong advocate for single payer, but I also want to recognize that seniors in uh, Medicare uh, have a single payer system, and that is a system we should learn from and expand. I like the idea of integrating uh, Medi-Cal with Medicare so we can provide more services uh, more efficiently and in a less confusing way for seniors. That's not in YOLO. It needs to be in YOLO. I absolutely understand that. So more to come. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. 
And uh, I'll, I'll have the next uh, question answered by Bill. Great, thank you very much. Uh, during this time of economic crisis, uh, the services to seniors, as we've talked about here today already, have been slashed and cut to the bone. And it, economies of scale have also been reduced. You know, where it becomes, you know, where we know that it's more efficient for uh, someone to stay in their own home, yet IHS S services are, you know, are, are being cut. And it just, uh, it, it really the cuts, when you take a look at what they are in comparison to the other cuts or the other, you know, it, you know things that have been reinstated are really insignificant in, cons in comparison when uh, you really look at the human element of, uh, you know, what this really means when somebody's, you know, forced to be removed from their home into a assisted living facility or from an assisted living facility into a skilled uh, skilled nursing facility. So uh, that, this is something that I think is very, very important that we work really hard and uh, get these, uh, you know, cuts uh, restored. You know, to, to provide a effective uh, care oversight, uh, uh, must be re restored, and we, you know, I talked about that in my, you know, my my opening comments. We, uh, you know, this there's this reverse, you know, mortgage situation that's going on right now, and and 10% uh, uh, mortgage uh, uh, defaults is is the number of the day, and you know, if there's 10 in default, how many do you really think that there are uh, that are in crisis, and the people are going through the worry and uh, you know, the state of mind uh, uh, for, you know, for people is a, a critical problem. And uh, I have some ideas on that, on how using the state ombuds, ombudsman, you know, program perhaps to review these things so that these people that are preying on these seniors, uh, uh, you know, stop. And then finally, as I said before, we need to have licensing and background checks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Dan? Uh, thanks. There's a, a number of things we can do. Number one, reverse the disinvestment that's been occurring. I talked about this before. I've seen it firsthand as a council, as a, um, a deputy county council for the county of Solano. That means IHSS. We've got to permit IHSS workers to get overtime. I think that's key. Mental health, certainly, uh, you know, CalFresh, Meals on Wheels, these. Got to reverse the disinvestment. That's absolutely critical. Second of all is we need to incorporate universal design into our building code. Okay, it's not it, part of our building code right now in the state. We, we're we're forward-looking in terms of our environmental sustainability. We need to be very forward-looking in terms of our universal design. The cannery, which I champion in large part because of its universal design principles, should not be the exception. That should be the rule. Third, we need greater regulation of assisted living facilities, and we need the creation of more assisted living facilities so that uh, folks can age in place and age or age with dignity and 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 that's 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 key and certainly um certainly that's you know we just that's not happening now Sec fourth is that we need to provide more grant loan programs like the one that i set up in davis uh, to allow folks to to renovate their houses to, to stay in place i think that's critical um another thing we need to do is we need stricter enforcement of our existing we have strong um elder abuse laws in California, thanks in large part to some of our Marimana, Senator Wolf, others. Problem is we don't have the resources to strictly enforce them. I mean, Elisa at Lisnick is seeing that. You know, I'm seeing that at the county in terms of our DA's resources. We need to, to have the resources to, to, to enforce those. And lastly, and this is more of a, a federal issue, but there is a role for the state, is that we have to preserve Medicare and Social Security. I think that's key. Um, so those are just a number of the things that I would, I would uh, do regarding uh, seniors. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. And uh, uh, please uh, write your questions down on the cards. Just hold them up and someone will come by and get the card or uh, feel free to approach the microphone. Uh, I do have one uh, uh, request for a question uh, that uh, relates to nursing homes. It's really a two-part question. Uh, uh, what, what can we do uh, to avoid uh, a placement uh, of seniors in nursing homes, those that don't necessarily have to be there? And then uh, uh, part two would be, what can we do to uh, uh, make sure that seniors are safe in nursing homes? Uh, start with you. Well, you know, clearly, it's, obviously, it's just it, it's much better to stay in assisted living facility than it is to go to that, you know, to that nursing home. And what's really interesting is how the funding and the incentives for the funding kind of point it more towards 
uh, towards towards nursing homes, and uh, I uh, I think that there's there's an incentive, uh, you know, often where uh, somebody ends up in a nursing home because the because of the cuts and everything that have happened that won't allow them to stay uh, in, in in assisted in, in assisted living. It's you know the the other thing in terms of assisted living isn't the panacea that uh, I mean, first of all it, it, it's. It's better about talking, I'm going to in, in, enforcement. You know, that's one of the things that was just shocking to me. While the state of California has rules and regulations and goes in and uh, look, checks out nursing homes and we all kind of saw some you know, really significant issues about that in that nursing home in Walnut Creek. But when it comes to oversight of assisted living, uh, it, it's, it's amazing. And this is, was brought to us by our commissioner on aging where uh, you know, somebody uh, because through the negligence of, uh, of somebody in an assisted living facility uh, dies and they come in and uh, the state comes in and, and the maximum fine is $10,000. Well, I can tell you, uh, I'm a hunter and I you know, know that there are rules and regulations with the California Department of Fish and Game that if you uh, uh, shoot the wrong animal, uh, you get fines uh, way sig more significant than $10,000. And I think this enforcement uh, and rules and regulations and fines uh, at all levels need to be bolstered uh, to protect our seniors all throughout the state of California. Thank you. Uh, Dan. Uh, this is a great question. The overarching idea, of course, and Sheila spoke to this before, is to ensure that, that seniors age with, with dignity and independence, and that's really that's this, this question really gets at that. I think the key is in-home supportive services, IHSS. Uh, that has been decimated by the state. It's been terrible what's happened on IHSS. I've seen it at the county level. Uh, you know, it goes beyond just issues like, um, you know, not, not allowing providers to, to get overtime, which I'm hoping the governor comes around on that one and something gets worked out at the legislature. But it goes beyond that. It goes uh, to the overarching issue of uh, providing those in-home services to, to a senior who's, who's living at home and, and, and needs help, um, but you know, we don't, doesn't want to go to the assisted living facility, which of course is much more expensive, not only for that senior, but of course for in, in a greater societal uh, context. So the key to me is in-home supportive services, and that gets to the heart of, of what I was saying before about this disinvestment and why it's, it, it's, it's really incumbent on our leaders uh, to reinvest. And certainly when it comes to then the assisted living facilities and, and, and nursing homes is there has to be much greater regulation of those. I've seen it firsthand uh, with my grandmother uh, uh, in terms of what we try to do in Davis and, and you see it throughout California, uh, these problems that, that exist at those assisted living facilities and they're good ones but we still have those, those issues. So the key is to have seniors be able to to age in place and to get healthcare in their homes. And that's why IHSS is so crucial. And of course, other things, uh, including rehabilitation programs and, and of course, building uh, homes <coughs> in the design in the first place. That, all that feeds into that independent living and that aging with dignity that's so critical. Thank you, Dan. And uh, our, our next uh, question uh, is, do we, have, we do have people at the microphone. I'm going to read one, and then we'll go to the microphone. We just, we're just having two people. I'm sorry. Did I miss you, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean to leave you out. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, you know, the, the, the first point I want to make, and I think we, we probably all agree up here, is that you know we have had a, a tremendous, tremendous champion in Rico Yamada um, over the, her six-year tenure in the California State Assembly. So whoever comes into the seat. You know, needs to carry up for her legacy. You know, she's now the chair of the Assembly Committee on Aging and Long-Term Care. Her bill, uh, AB 1816, is one of these bills to kind of tighten up the regulatory oversight of homes. Uh, let's talk about nursing homes a little bit. Uh, In-home supportive services, absolutely critical. Since 2011, in-home supportive services cut 8%. That's significant. One of my concerns about this governor's budget is that we didn't go back and look at all the things that over the last three or four years we've been not able to fund uh, or we've cut back like IHSS and bring them back in. So one of the things that I would do in the assembly is make sure we're looking back at those things that have suffered, not just forgetting them uh, completely. 
I'll tell you from my own personal experience and talking to friends, that there seems to be this kind of growing industry where people are able to provide senior care in their home. Uh, they can become an IHSS worker, they can unionize through uh, SEIU, they can get paid, they can get, uh, they can take care of their loved one, but maybe two or three others. And that provides a job for them. It uses our existing housing stock to provide services. It keeps seniors connected uh, with other seniors and with somebody who could be their liaison out into the community. So I'd really like to explore how we could create more flexibility. I think we might be getting a little locked into, you know, long-term care facilities and assisted living care facilities and nursing facilities, and let's provide seniors with as much choice uh, as possible. And certainly, adult and protective services are key. Uh, Janet's parents have been uh, victims of elder abuse uh, by somebody who knew them, uh, with us in close contact with them, but it still, uh, it still happened, and there was a tremendous theft from their assets right under their nose uh, and so on. So I have had experience in elder abuse uh, firsthand without any questions. So those are a few thoughts of mine uh, on this very important question. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Joe. And uh, I'm gonna read a question. This will go to, uh, first to Dan, then to Joe, then to Bill. Uh, the question is, middle income families often fall through the cracks because of their inability to pay privately for many senior services. That, that one example of this would be in-home supportive services. Uh, where, where there is an income qualification. Uh, do you have any ideas to address this disparity? Dan? Yes, um, it is true uh, that, you know, if you're on the hiring and end of the income uh, spectrum, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're, you're doing a lot better and you're able to, to you know, get these services and, and to, to age uh, with a lot more resources than, than others. At the low end, uh, I would disagree with, with, with something that Joe did say earlier. I wouldn't say that folks, you know, seniors on Medi-Cal are doing fine. You know, they're, they're certainly struggling, and it's not as if they're not falling through the cracks as we've seen with these cuts, you know, whether it's the CalFresh program or the mental health program or, or IHSS. So you've got certainly, certainly that. But yes, there, there is also in the middle income there, you know, folks who, who maybe, uh, who, who maybe are exempted from some of these programs, but also but are are uh, are really getting squeezed in terms of their uh, ability to, to pay for these, and that that's you know you see it not just in, in seniors, you see it in, in other areas, and just uh, this general squeeze that the middle class is under um, inequality in, in California is really growing, and you see that in, in in terms of seniors as well in terms of those services. So so I think it's really incumbent on on us as policymakers to do what we can to to address those. I mean, obviously, you have to focus on uh, again those those at the at the bottom of that spectrum, but 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 certainly not neglect you know those sort of in the middle that are that are are getting squeezed and and, and do what you can on that front. Okay, thank you, uh, Joe. Okay. Uh, yeah, I raised this uh, raised this earlier, just kind of making sure that we don't forget about the middle income seniors. A few things that I would uh, I would kind of add to this. I mean, I think that uh, you know tax credits so that middle income folks can take a deduction to modify their homes to make sure they can uh, age in place in their existing homes is uh, is is something we could uh, move forward with uh, right away. There's no question about that. I think uh, you know more subsidies for for senior affordable housing that gets a little bit higher up in the income classifications and again provides a housing stock. Uh, that serves middle income seniors is important to think about. I also think the general movement, uh, which I've been part of as a director of our Sacramento Area Council of Governments toward providing more housing options, more transit oriented development, uh, greater density. Uh, with the cannery subdivision, uh, we certainly had the, the kind of the, the, the senior elements that were requested by the um, Senior Citizen Commission and others. Uh, but we also created kind of a diverse housing pool within it. It was more, it wasn't, you know, kind of a lot of these larger homes that we built, for example, in Lake Alhambra, but we did a lot of things that are more kind of in the middle, and those would serve uh, exactly these types of uh, seniors uh, as well. I also want to uh, call out transit again, right? And helping seniors have transportation is very important for their mobility. The average cost of a car in California is $9,000 a year. Right, and so you know, one of the things we pioneered here in Davis was was Zipcar to make sure that people, you know, for you know eight nine dollars an hour can at least get a car when they need it. And I've had people say, you know, we created a Zipcar budget of two hundred dollars a month. We never use that, and we shed a car. Well, that's nine thousand. So I think anything we can do to just help people in our community save money uh, is a good thing. Thank you, Joe. 
Bill? Well, I, I was hoping I'd get a few better ideas uh, on the panel here in terms of maybe I could uh, add, add to that. Actually, uh, that tax credit, uh, uh, Joe, was, I, I think, a good idea. Oftentimes, though, at this that income level, uh, you know, it's nebulous in terms of, you know, how many of them are, you know, making that much, you know, earning that much money and, 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 and what, that, what that can do. You know, it, it's... Uh, it, this hits close home to me because, uh, and I'm a, in my concluding remarks, uh, tell a little story about it, but my mom was hit with that same middle class, uh, uh, you know, problem where uh, she was kind of forced out of a, a, you know, a hospital because Medicare wouldn't, uh, you know, pay anymore. We can go into that another time, but, you know, re really, uh, I, I think that what we've got to do is we've got to evaluate what the income limits really are, and maybe even index uh, to the cost of living uh, that amount. My guess is is the the income amounts uh, are set. They've been set what 1985 or so, and so you know everything else should you know a, a lot of these other factors where you, where you have in government spending and everything are are linked to the consumer price index or the income in, in, in index. Uh, that would go a long way, perhaps, in bringing that coverage up for uh, you know middle income middle income people that have been squeezed out of the, uh, those benefits. Thank you. We are going to uh, go to our uh, speakers who have been pac patiently waiting to ask questions, uh, and uh, this will be a question addressed to all three. Uh, we'll start go back to the uh, order of Dan, Joe, and Bill answering the question. Uh, my name is Joan Beasley, and I'm with Yobel County Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health, coordinator for the Mental Health Services Act. So as you might guess, here's a Mental Health Services Act question. In 2004, California voters passed the Mental Health Services Act, which imposes a 1% tax on individuals with incomes over a million dollars. The act has identified older adults as an underserved population but there is a lot of competition for these dollars. Currently, Yolo County receives about between six and seven million dollars a year in revenue from the Mental Health Services Act. Share with us your approach to the MHSA and specifically its programs for seniors. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned MHSA and I, I would just say that Senator Steinberg who championed it is a, is, a, is a supporter of mine, someone I've had long conversations with about mental health. Mental health is, is, is really, a, you know, gets back to that disinvestment that I was speaking of before. It's really a key reason why I'm running. That's really where you've seen that disinvestment occurring. And that's, it's not just in, in terms of seniors, but you certainly see it there and, and it was called out or is called out in the MHSA. Uh, but you see it, you know, in all parts, uh, you know, in, in all demographics, and, and it reverberates in all aspects of our society. I mean, it's hard to find an issue, um, certainly an issue today, that, that doesn't at some point touch upon mental health. So the MHSA was wonderful. I thought it was great. I think there, there are a couple things about it. First is that it, it's limited in terms of what it can fund, and, you know, this, it sort of focuses on new programs instead of existing programs. I think that's a limitation that, that, that I find concerning about it. And second of all is it's, it's good in terms of its funding, but, you know, we, we need a lot, a lot more of it. Um, so, you know, I have, I'm certainly supportive of the MHSA. I think it's been, it's been good, and, and, you know, I know Yolo County has gotten uh, millions, and we've seen it in Solano as well, and those have gone to some very good programs. But, um, we need to be doing more in Sacramento in terms of assuring that, that programs that, that can't get funding from the MHSA get that funding, whether because of, of rules, the MHSA itself, or in terms of just a, a general lack of funding. And it, it's key to have champions for mental health, like Senator Steinberg, um, in Sacramento. There aren't enough of them, and I would absolutely be a champion. I, I, I can't stress that enough. I've seen it firsthand at the, personally, I've seen it at the county. It's just, it's so critical, mental health services to, to our society, seniors or otherwise. Thanks. Thank you. Joe. Uh, first of all, I'd observe that Yolo County has really a, a tremendous uh, legacy and even a leadership position, if you will, in mental health issues. And so I was very pleased to see in Sheila's opening presentation, you know, making sure that we're linking the existing resources of the county 
in mental health with senior issues. And so, you know, to, to, to try to think about as much as possible kind of breaking down the different silos between programs and making sure that we're all learning from each other uh, exactly kind of what this, you know, big grant is doing here, what brings us all together into this room. You know, I would look to uh, advance, you know, kind of that, that theme uh, overall. Uh, there's no question, uh, as I've done my reading, that depression and suicide is going up, and Sheila uh, mentioned that as well. Again, that's good <coughs> between uh, the, you know, the mainstream mental health services and over into the seniors as well. Uh, I understand this issue of uh, no geriatric psychiatrists uh, in Yolo County. Uh, I had heard that it was low. Uh, Sheila said that it's, it's no. You know, that's something where we've obviously got to uh, you know, spend some time and attention. Uh, and then there's lots of been uh, cuts overall to county mental health uh, facilities. And uh, there again, we have to make sure we're taking care of the existing programs uh, and that the you know, Prop 3, uh, 63 budget cuts were, were part of that. We need to you know, be you know, continually looking you know, kind of back at the things that we've cut uh, and make sure we're learning from the good of what we did cut and making sure that as funding becomes available, uh, we get those things uh, we get those things back in so uh, that would be you know some of my some of my experience uh, and some of my thoughts that I bring to the question so thank you very much great um, don't have a lot more to to uh, add to to that except for I, I really do think that we need uh, to expand these two existing uh, programs you know perhaps the requirement that it would be just to fund new uh, you know programs is you know maybe uh, was, was the way to, to move forward uh, in the first place. What we did when we got cut uh, from the uh, state of California and Napa County, and I can just go back to you know, my experience and what we've done, we've had a policy, just like we had a policy that we didn't want to handle um, uh, caregiver licensing and ha add that expense to the county government because that's really not a county responsibility. When times get tough, we have to take care of people. And so, we really believe, and, and you know, look, I'm an, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think it's going to take people in Sacramento that have experience, that have the ability to roll up their sleeves and think creatively and find new solutions to these problems. But in, until until that happens, what we've done, we've had a, a no overmatch policy at, in the county of Napa. That's why fiscally we've been so good, you know, over the years. But you know, look, we saw these programs go by the wayside and, you know, faced with cutting these things. I mean, look, they have had cuts, but we have not had the cuts in services that other counties have had to do because our board has found the money and we've overmatched. And overmatch just means, you know, normally you have a match with the state of California uh, on, you know, whatever the local share, uh, share is, uh, or if there is no share at all and they're cutting the program where the county puts in the money, and that's what we've done uh, to sustain our programs in that county. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from the cards, and we'll, we'll start with Joe, go to Bill and Dan. Uh, th this question is a little bit different, but the, the concern expressed is uh, the prices that uh, seniors will have to pay for food and uh, the impacts uh, on seniors of loss uh, of revenue in our community as a result of the drought and uh, a lack of availability of water for farmers. Uh, the question is, uh, what would you do about our water issue? Let's start again with uh, Joe. Uh, very good. Uh, look, this is, uh, Yolo, whether it's Yolo County or, or Napa, uh, we are, uh, we're agricultural economies uh, out here and it's absolutely wonderful. 80% uh, of our water in the state of California is spent on agriculture and so the question is uh, spot on. Uh, that we have to be thinking about the connection between the water availability and our agricultural economy. Uh, certainly, we need to make sure that in Northern California, in this district, we're protecting the water rights uh, that we have so that we can make sure that the crops are, are viable. I'm very proud of my role in the Woodland Davis Clean Water uh, Agency project. I'm the chair of the Woodland Agency Clean Water Project. It's a huge project. Uh, but concurrent with that, we adopted new water rates uh, in the city of Davis, and those water rates are arguably the most conservation-oriented water rates in certainly Northern California and maybe even beyond. Part of what they mean for seniors, quite frankly, is low water users will have much less of an increase than those who use a lot of water. And so I viewed those rates as both supportive of low-income folks in our community and seniors uh, in our community. 
Uh, but we also have a great obligation here, again, I think the link to many of the great projects going on in the county with regard to food uh, and health. Uh, between our farmer's market, getting more seniors to our farmer's market, we've got uh, direct access to markets, we've got direct access to fresh food. The more our community can kind of eliminate the cost of food distribution and the cost of the middle person in the food chain, the more we can bring lower cost, healthier foods in our breath the end. So whether it's here at the Senior Citizen or uh, Center or to some of our um, senior facilities, whether it's uh, Roosevelt or now um, the Chavez Plaza and, and so on, we have the opportunity to make sure we bring healthy food to our seniors at a lower cost. And I look forward to doing those things. Thank you. Uh, Bill. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not encouraged, at least for this year, uh, what, you know, obviously, again, being the eternal optimist, I'm very hopeful that we start getting some uh, significant amount of rains because um, I just don't think that the government has the ability to do things, uh, you know, that quickly that is going to help, help the pricing uh, schedules of things that are going to come out this summer. I mean, you've got cities like Davis that's done a great job with their water. I think the city of Napa has done the same thing. Uh, we put in water reclamation plants. We're already doing that. So that the lower rates that people have that conserve water <laughs> that are already in place are really going to have to, uh, you know, do most of the job. But the economic uh, realities to this of, the, of a drought today and the pricing on food, you know, in the you know in the in, in the near future within the next six months, just realistically to address the question. I'm not, I, I'm not hopeful. I'm, I'm more hopeful that, uh, that we can get some rain in here so that the farmers can uh, alleviate the, the significant problems that uh, wait for them in, you know, in the future if we don't get the rain. Um, you know, just, uh, uh, yeah, I think Joe's uh, you know, answer in terms of uh, you know, lowering the other cost of food in terms of delivering everything was, you know, you know, was spot on. That seems to me to be you know, again, another long-term solution. But the other thing is we got to go back and look back at the regulations that this state has put on our farmers and the contribution to the cost of our food. Uh, look at, I, we can't ignore the middle class any longer. We can't talk about the, the divide between the rich and the poor and, and not want to increase the minimum wage. But we've got to be realistic in terms of, and I think the plan that the legislature has right now for that is uh, very, very appropriate, but we've got to be careful of what we do that's going to increase the cost of our food to our citizens. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Our uh, next uh, question will come from the microphone. I never answered Oh, I'm sorry. Dan? <laughs> <laughs> and I want to answer the water question. I, uh, I, uh, I, among other things that the county, besides dealing with a lot of these issues, senior related issues, uh, mental health, I deal with water. I'm the county's uh, water attorney, essentially, and focus on the Delta. Food prices certainly were rising before the drought, and the drought is just exacerbating it. It's, it's frustrating to see food prices rising while you see land going fallow because of, of a lack of water. It's, it's, it's terrible and it, it, it conjures up images of the grapes of wrath, you know, that kind of, uh, that, that, that type of situation is terrible. Um, a couple things I'd like to say, it's hard to answer a question about water in, in two minutes. First of all is, is we need greater conservation. Uh, even, even in agriculture, we can, we can do even more conservation. Um, the, you know, there's more we can do in, in, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of, of looking at different technologies and, and in terms of ensuring that our, our water is used uh, most wisely. More we can do on that front. And this, of course, raises the biggest water issue in certainly this district, but the state, and that is the, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan tunnels plan by the governor. And I am unequivocally opposed to the BDCP tunnels plan. That's clear. And no legislator from this district should be at, at all in favor of that or any component of that. I stand with, you know, with Congressman Garamendi about on that. I stand with Senator Wolf, Senator Marimata, Supervisor Provenz has been very strong on that. Um, and the key, the, the biggest issue with the B, there are a number of issues, but certainly is the threat to our water supply here in the north, and, 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 and also is the effect it's going to have on the delta, and the, the real elimination of a lot of our agricultural land without true mitigation. And that's a real big concern of mine. So 
those are a couple of things that I would say about the drought and, and food prices. But it's it's arguably the biggest concern right now in this district in terms of, of our water. Thank you, Thank you Dan. Uh, we'll go next to our uh, our uh, questioner at the microphone, and the order of the answers will be uh, Bill, Dan, and Joe. Thank you. Joe, you want to move it down a little? Elaine Roberts Musser, and I'm part of the advocacy group on the Yellow Healthy Aging Alliance. This is going to be a tough question. Um, in the Yellow Healthy Aging Alliance, we've noticed that so many of the cuts are foolish. They're penny wise and pound foolish. We've seen cuts in IHSS, older adult program, uh, those sorts of cuts that end up robbing seniors of their independence and then putting them in nursing homes, which is more expensive even to the state. That makes no sense. So my question is, how are you going to get the legislature, as a, as a potential legislator, how are you going to get the legislator to take a harder look at the decisions they're making so that they aren't petty wise and pound foolish? And I know as a, on another issue, I was testifying before the Law Revision Commission of the legislature. And uh, I was amazed that there were lobbyists who had gotten into, in there and had convinced the committee to gut consumer protections. And uh, I had a list of them, and, and it was just, it was glaring. And I said, what are you doing? And they essentially put back all of those. But it took a citizen coming forward to say anything. If I hadn't said anything, you would have your consumer protections gutted. So as legislators, what are you going to do to make sure that our consumer protections stay in place and that we don't make foolish decisions that are penny-wise and pound-foolish? Okay. Let's start with Bill on that. Well, I brought that up in, in, in my uh, earlier points that uh, the economies of scale have been absolutely lost with the state of California on these uh, proposals, these cuts where you know, you, you're got, you know, uh, you know, Medicare or uh, even Medi-Cal in some cases they're paying for some things that could, uh, you know, be, uh, be used uh, a lot more efficiently, you know, elsewhere. But to the question really is what would I do as a legislature? I would do the same thing that Betty Rhodes did to me. Uh, you know, look at, uh, I, would, I, I would sit down and this is what I think that has been lost in, in many parts of the legislature is the camaraderie and people getting together. I am a centrist. There is just absolutely no about, no doubt about that. And uh, you know the thing is, is I don't really believe that senior issues know partisan uh, concerns. And we and and, and, and you know, everybody that's up there in that legislature has uh, a, a mother, a father, a grandmother, a grandfather, a brother, or sister, or somebody. That has gone through this, gone through these, through these issues, and I, I just think it's, uh, I, I, I don't know, it, it, it defies common sense. Uh, the funding we have right now, without these econ economies of scale, and frankly, I think that the legislature currently today uh, ought to be readdressing this because, um, yeah, and, and the, but then there's the, the, there are these, you know, issues. It's a, you know, there are federal guidelines and obviously funding sources and. You know, in state, but uh, I think it's just a matter of regrouping and rolling up the sleeves and, 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 and getting it done. Uh, the money is there, the savings are there, uh, and it makes sense to do it. Yeah. Um, Elaine, that's a wonderful question. It really, I've talked about it before today and elsewhere. It, it gets to the heart of, of really why I'm learning. There's been this disinvestment and these programs, yes, that, you know, whether it's mental health whether it's IHSS, yes, they, they, they cost a bit of money. But they're great investments, both in terms of you know, the short term, in terms of what's happening, you know, in terms of the, the dollars that are going out then, but it's, it's preventing sort of these larger issues. And IHSS is a perfect example of that. I mean, if someone doesn't get IHSS services, they end up in assisted living or nursing homes, or if the IHSS provider isn't getting overtime, you have to think about hiring another, or it's more expensive. The, I, I think this, this, this raises it, and, and I, I disagree with, with Bill uh, respectfully about, uh, it, it has in many ways become partisan. It has 
there is a sense among a number of folks in, in Sacramento um, that, uh, that, that government doesn't have this role to play in terms of investing. And in the past, our government has played this strong role. And you know, it's not just in senior issues, you see it in education and in infrastructure. And we have to have leaders who are willing to reinvest. And I believe the people of this state are willing to do that. Certainly this district, the conversations I've had, they all agree, these ideas that I talk about, certainly in places like Lake County, which has the highest poverty rate of any county in the state. They understand that we have these challenges and that it takes a concerted effort by our leaders to reinvest and, and, and to address these issues, both in the short and long term, and that's exactly why I'm running. So your 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 question really gets at the heart of, of, of why I'm running and, and why it's it's so critical right now to have leaders in the legislature who, who understand that. That's a it's a great question. Um, first of all, Elaine, thank you for your service as chair of the Senior Citizen Commission, and chair of the Water Advisory Commission, your your role in Yolo County. Uh, we've talked about IHSS, and we've, and we've talked about how we all know uh, that those are better investments than putting people in bigger institutional facilities with higher overhead costs and, to some extent, more isolation for our seniors and, and less livable situations. Um, where my thinking goes on this is an article that was in The Atlantic about nine months ago. It was a piece by uh, Peter Orzog, who was the budget director for Obama at the beginning of the administration, and he pointed out how little money we put into the analysis of government programs after we've put enormous amounts of money uh, into funding them. And what does that result in? It results in kind of lockstep, kind of doing the same thing we did, or getting into these more <laughs> partisan battles of are you pro or are you con? So my decision to run for this assembly seat was highly influenced by the fact that we have a new term limit rule in California, where whoever gets this seat is gonna be able to serve for 12 years. And I look forward to serving in the assembly for 12 years. And what that means really gets to a little bit of what Bill alluded to, which is I think we're gonna have a new culture in the legislature. Whether it is Democrat or Republican, we're gonna have a body that gets to know each other for a number of years, and we're gonna have a great opportunity to really analyze these programs, decide what works, what doesn't work, how we mesh these programs with our counties and the federal funding formulas that are gonna come through, the Affordable Care Act, going to single payer, there's gonna be all these things. So I look forward to being a bit post-partisan, certainly not uh, shrill in my tone, and working with everybody and doing kind of the analysis and coming together as a legislature to create kind of coherent programs that build over time and make sure we put our money where it's gonna have the greatest impact. And that holds true for seniors, but all kinds of areas of government need this kind of greater analysis of what we're doing and where we should go. Thank you. Bill. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, but I hope as long as you gave that open, you know, we, only, we only have a two-thirds majority of us Democrats that are there. So, so the reality is, is it is a problem because where we are right now, our legislators aren't fully funding these things and are letting these uh, economic, uh, you know, issues uh, uh, become a problem. I've tried to vary the order in our, as a result. I confused myself, so I for that. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, we're not going to have time to answer all the questions, the, uh, so we're going to take uh, uh, two more from the mic, and then I'll try to take another from the, the cards that I got, and we'll need to go on to concluding statements so we can finish by 11.50, as <coughs> promised. And then, however, uh, I think the candidates, if they can, uh, don't have someplace else they have to rush off to, can stay behind and answer other questions. Uh, I received a, a couple that were more political than relating to senior issues, and we should ask those individually because this is an educational event, and or, or save it for the uh, Democratic Club or the Republican Club or whatever else uh, other forum is, is, is more of a political one. So uh, I'll go to the uh, microphone, and we'll go uh, with Joe, Bill, and Dan on this one. My name is Judy Reynolds, and I have a question because I have a 98-year-old um, aunt who is presently in her home only because of assistance. She has hired a person to help her 24 hours a day. And Dan, you're, you mentioned just briefly in passing the issue of uh, overtime pay for workers who are doing in-home care. And I personally, because I'm a union file, I love unions, 
And so I think it's a good idea for people to get overtime pay, but when you're talking about 24-hour workers, that gets a little difficult for anybody to afford uh, help at that point. So I guess my question is, is there a way to compromise, not compromise, but deal with both the issues of the need for in-care workers get decent pay, and those who are having 24-hour care, somehow a compromise on that issue where you could get people paid decently and get people who are in my aunt's position to be able to afford home care so they don't have to go into an assisted living or a restaurant. So, uh, Judy, excellent question. Actually, this has come up in a couple other forums in, in different contexts, so each of us is going to have a little bit of time to think about this and learn about it. But the, the big picture here that everybody should know is in in-home supportive services, the federal government has laid down the law and said there's not going to be overtime paid. So that creates this problem where you get to 40 hours a week, and after that, the federal would say we're not going to pay overtime. Uh, and then, um, and then, the, and then, well, the Fed said we won't pay overtime, and then Jerry Brown has said no overtime, right? How's it? Yeah, so, so you've kind of got this difference between the state and the feds, and it goes back to, I think, a little bit of what I was talking about, where you're gonna have to roll up your sleeves as a legislature. I don't think there's any senior in this room who wants to have the system so expensive that other seniors are gonna be denied service, and this is a zero-sum game at some level, right? We can invest as much as we want, but at some point, we're gonna have to make sure we make the best use of the dollars that we've got. So I would look forward to being a member of the legislature that kind of plays between this, you know, this 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 argument that's going on over uh, over over time. I think in general the IHSS workers would like the ability to at least work a little bit more, even if it's without overtime, because they want to care about their patient, right? You have this terrible problem if somebody works 40 hours and then they have to stop working because there won't be the pay, then you've got to pick up another worker to go beyond that 40. So this is an area where you know the states and the feds have to be locked in a room and they have to figure out how they're gonna do it and they're gonna do it in a fair way uh, that's, a, that's affordable. Uh, and it's a terrible problem right now. Everybody's kind of put themselves in their corners uh, and that's the kind of thing I wouldn't stand for. So one of the kind of examples of a problem as mayor where you know, we're sitting down trying to figure out how we balance competing interests and find a solution. So it's gonna to be tough, uh, and uh, I don't know that I'd be satisfied with the answer that I've given, uh, but, but, but you know, two big powerful sides have laid down and said they disagree, and it's gonna be a challenge. Bill? Yeah, I mean, it, it even goes further because the cuts are um, less than uh, 40 hours a week, so the quality of care and, uh, and the gaps in, in, in care are e even more even more critical, and so uh, the, you know this, this has been a, a, a real connection for us in Napa County. I sit on the IHSS, uh, you know, authority. Um, you know, we we've, we've actually gone to the point where we try. We're I guess it's a small county, but we're fourth highest uh, paying uh, in, um, IHSS workers in the state of California, and. Uh, we wanted to give a raise because we were concerned about them not getting overtime, and you know we have a, a, a you know just just a problem. We look at these people are just doing incredible work. They're uh, dedicated, uh, and the, what they're getting paid, I think, is uh, really a slap in the face uh, compared to the role that they are providing, not only for our communities, our state, but uh, for the families that they are and the patients that they're serving. So we went and tried to give them a 50 cent an hour raise, which is, you know, not the be all and the end all, but up to $12 an hour, you know, now. And the state of California came back to us and said, look, it, if you do that, because the state's going to take this program over, we don't know exactly when this is, but I think in the next year or, or two, perhaps. <coughs> And the state of California says, if you raise their rates 50 cents an hour, when we're taking over this program, you have the responsibility for the maintenance of effort, which means we would be paying 50 cents an hour for the rest of the time, even though we'd be out of the program. And so it's really, uh, you know, one of those things that, you know, uh, is, uh, I think, again, penny wise and pound foolish. I know the state obviously has to watch their costs as they go into the program. Once they take it over, you can't have counties that are so high and others are so low because they're going to have to balance it. My time's up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Dan? Uh, great. Uh, thanks for that question, Judy. Um, 
who happens to be my Cub Scout pack leader when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, Judy. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I would just urge uh, you know, Joe and, and others to, to talk to those IHS workers. They, they want that overtime pay. They deserve that overtime pay. I can't think of, honestly, a stronger um, advocacy issue for, for IHS workers than that overtime issue. It's a really big issue right now. And it's you know a value judgment of mine. I, I believe they deserve overtime, um, and we we've, we've got to make that happen. It's just uh, you know that's how I come down on that issue. They deserve overtime, uh, just like other workers. And um, like Bill, I work um, in Solano County, uh, you know, and, and I'm familiar with this with this issue of, of <coughs> and have have seen up front those those challenges. And and Judy certainly presents a. a you know, really, it's a it's a good point about how yes, it it is it is more expensive to provide that overtime. It is true, but you know, it's just something that I believe is is um, is is something that those those workers deserve. And again, just getting back to the entire issue of IHSS, uh, which you've been talking a lot about, is is it gets back to that that disinvestment that you've seen uh, in IHSS, which I think. Um, you know, not only hurts in the short term, but certainly in the long term, and as Elaine Roberts Musser's question went to in terms of folks not having access to IHSS. So, uh, yeah, this is just one of those where it's just a, a value to mine, of mine that I believe those those workers deserve overtime, um, and uh, we uh, we need to as as a state uh, fund it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I went, but but I. But I would say, you know, it, it's the, the issue is that the federal government has said you must pay overtime, and the state has said you may not earn overtime. So that that, that just creates this conundrum that we're in now. I uh, have a question. <coughs> one more from the cards, uh, and then and then go to the microphone for one more, and then we'll go to the uh, closing statements. Uh, the uh, question from the cards is that uh, uh, expresses a concern that. Uh, low-income seniors are having a very difficult time with housing, uh, that the waiting lists are very long, uh, and that there's an age gap. You have to be 62, uh, but uh, there are seniors between 55 and 62 that uh, uh, this questioner believes are left out, and also uh, those who are 55 and disabled. So the question is, uh, what would you do to address uh, the gaps in low-income housing for seniors? And uh, we will uh, start with Bill on that one. You save the, the you save the toughest one for last. I, you know that is uh, that is a conundrum. You know, I listened to uh, you know Dan talk about uh, you know the overtime and, and 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 you know adding that cost. And I've you know, heard him talk before about adding universal pre school, which is I totally agree with too. But you know, at some point in time, I don't I don't know. You know there's 3.5 billion dollars in universal preschool. What's the cost of you know going? I don't know what we're going to do, you know, frankly, because we're looking at a state budget that, um, you know, while I think it's better than it's ever, than it's been in recent memory, but the reality is in three years, you've got uh, the, the tax that's coming, you know, off of 30, and that's going to be, you know, that's going to have to be addressed. Um, you know, I know that the housing uh, authorities have long waiting lists. I know that we do in Napa, and I think that's a, you know, a, a real big concern, and there's got to be some sort of incentive, you know, for the state perhaps that you know that will be it, that you know will allow some housing opportunities. But I, you know, I I don't have the magic answer. Perhaps uh, you know my colleagues will. Yep. Me or Dan? Jeff. Okay. Uh, fine. Uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit. Um, you know the the affordability is, is is critical. Exactly where these gaps are, I would look forward to, to learning. Uh, I think I won't go long on this uh, and, and and speculate. Uh, I think more diverse housing choices within communities are a solution for for all generations. I think we've locked ourselves too much into the kind of standard single family home on a big lot. I think more people want to live more compactly, closer in, closer to transit, and that works for seniors, and hopefully that works for at least some of this class of seniors that are uh, part of this question. Uh, I think that the, the theme I brought up earlier, which is kind of helping more people use their existing home to provide care for seniors 
where we might have three or four or five in a house is a very strong economic model that can make sure people don't fall through the cracks, can stay more connected to others, uh, can share experiences, can share transit, uh, can share car costs, can you know, can share Davis Community Transit ideas, things like that. So uh, those are some of my thoughts. Uh, I agree with Bill. These are, these are tough challenges. And we have to think tremendously about how we communicate the trust we need the public to give us. I mean, we need to instill in the public's mind that the elected officials are making the best possible use of your dollars. Uh, and I wanna do that. I wanna be able to tell people this is the most economically viable solution that we've got to provide the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And if we don't do that, the revenue side, which we desperately need, is gonna fall apart because people aren't gonna trust that the government is spending their money wisely. Uh, I'm actually very proud of a number of things we've done in Davis to try to show that we're spending the public dollar wisely, uh, and I think that holds true in, in this context as well. And Dan, how would you address the gap in uh, senior housing? Uh, first of all, I appreciate Bill bringing up uh, a few of my platforms. You can see more of those at www.dan.org. <laughs> but, uh, including Universal Free School, I appreciate that, Bill. Um, so, yes, this is a, there's, a, there's a couple things to be said about this issue. I think it's really critical. First is, um, is you know, that it's worth looking at, at, at the current laws as they relate to, to senior-only housing developments, uh, qualified, you know, senior-qualified housing. I think it's worth uh, taking a look at those, seeing if they if they're make sense uh, with our, our changing um, society. Second of all is, uh, Again, it gets back to this disinvestment that you've seen in, in two main areas that hit really on this, and Bill mentioned it before, or touched upon it, was Section 8 housing, which comes from the federal government funding. Uh, that's been being cut. That allows a lot of, um, of, of folks to be able to afford uh, housing. Uh, certainly, uh, there are huge waiting lists for that. There were huge waiting lists for that when I worked on it in, as a law student at a clinic in Berkeley, and there, it's, it's even grown now. Another one is, is the demise of redevelopment uh, in California, which provided, at least in the city of Davis, for example, 95% of our affordable housing was funded through redevelopment. That's gone away, and I understand why it went away. I'm not disagreeing with that. I think that though we have to find ways of, of, of um, funding the good that went away with redevelopment, and one of those mainly is affordable housing. And there's a lot of uh, folks in the legislature working on that, and I think it's something that we need to focus on. Um, but. The long-term goal of this is the is our projects like the Cannery projects is to is to ensure that we both provide housing in the first place and to provide senior-friendly housing, um, multi-generational housing that, that's that's close to transit, that's that's close to services, and the Cannery it, it epitomizes that. I'm not saying it's a it's a, the be all and end all of that, but it's it, it you know we have to have that kind of development. We have to, first of all, look to, to create more development uh, that is senior friendly. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, again, it gets back to universal design principles and my time's up, but there's a lot to be said for this. Thank you, Dan. And we're gonna go to a final question, but before I do that, again, thank you everyone for submitting the questions. And I know there are a number that we didn't get to, but again, feel free to come up and ask the, the candidates uh, after we finish the forum. Uh, our last question. Hi, Peggy Phelps. Uh, I work with family caregivers under the National Caregiver Support Program. And um, uh, I just wanted to share with you in this forum, um, kind of, maybe it's a summary a little bit of some of the needs that you've, you've addressed. Uh, sounds like all three of you are um, aware of many of the issues. Uh, I want to point out a couple of other things. Um, of course, the in-home caregiving is a major issue. I think it's, you need to be careful. You keep talking about IHSS. That is for low-income uh, people. And when we're talking about in-home caregiving, uh, the big, big gap is those who don't qualify for IHSS services, as well as uh, uh, they are on a fixed income. Uh, they may be uh, uh, able to care for the person at home for a while, but if you're caring for somebody with dementia, it becomes a 24-7 job. Uh, many, um, and it's mainly women, need to quit their jobs, stay home and care for uh, that person. Uh, they can't afford to put them, uh, place them in assisted living where they would get 
three eight-hour shifts of 24-hour care instead of that one person uh, providing that 24-hour care. So we really, um, there's a lack of availability of trained caregivers. Uh, we have no licensing requirements in the state for caregivers, no training requirements. Anybody can say, I'll come and take care of your, your mom or your, your spouse for $10 an hour. You pay them cash under the table, and we have a, the whole labor uh, issue is, is another thing. And partly because now, since January 1st, the new labor law that's come into effect uh, has raised the cost of uh, agency um, caregivers to almost to the point where uh, you can't afford to hire somebody uh, from an agency because of the overtime and the insurance requirements. Um, so I'm doing this, pointing this out. I don't know what the answers are. I just know we really need to look at the <coughs> caregiving industry. And because we need trained caregivers, maybe there needs to be something in the job training programs uh, through ROP, through community colleges, for some certificate kind of programs to train caregivers so that, and some ways, some easier ways to do background checks. Uh, we need a private registry for caregivers similar to the public authority that does the IHSS uh, uh, registry for caregivers. Um, and uh, many of the people who want to work independently as caregivers maybe need some business training on how to be a self-employed independent contractor type of caregiver, uh, which we really don't have right now. Um, there's a big uh, insurance gap. Uh, people think when they go on Medicare that that's going to take care of all their health insurance needs. Then they go to a hospital, acute hospital, are there for two days, need to go to a skilled nursing and find out that Medicare does not continue to pay for the skilled nursing because they were not in the hospital three days. Um, and so uh, we have a big gap in the Medicare insurance piece there. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to see under the new Affordable Health Care Act that people can supplement their Medicare with Medi-Cal, possibly, uh, that helps. But uh, it's um, a big gap in the insurance. And we can make a change in California. Um, we've kind of set our own parameters with the Covered California. And so I think you, have a, you, you could have an influence there in that area. Um, well, could we that then narrow it to one question? Okay. <laughs> I really don't have a question. I just want to okay. be like, and then, uh, I think maybe, it's, maybe I can help you. Uh, you okay, you let did me raise one more minute. Okay. Um, uh, affordable housing is not necessarily affordable for low income people. So when you're talking low income and affordable, you're talking two different things. And so we, that's another area that really needs to be addressed. Budget wise in the state, um, as you know, that we've had a lot of cuts. We've talked about how to um, enforce some of the regulations. We maybe have enough regulations, but we need the ombudsman program was cut. The caregiver resource center program uh, staffing was cut. These are ways that can help monitor and help caregivers uh, access services. So um, those are just some of the things I wanted to, to add to what you, I know you're already aware of. Thank you very much. Thank you. You raised a number of very good points and very good background for, uh, but since there isn't, isn't a specific question, I think we'll go directly uh, to the uh, closing statements. And I'll ask the, can uh, uh, the candidates are free to address any of the issues raised uh, uh, throughout uh, the forum today or any new issues. And, and uh, please feel dis dis free to discuss whatever you want. Don't have to limit it to senior issues. This is your chance uh, to uh, give some concluding remarks and uh, sell yourself to our audience. Uh, we're going to go in reverse order for the closing statements, uh, starting with uh, Supervisor Bill Dodd. We're going to uh, do up to three to five minutes. Uh, you can do three, or if you want to go five, that's fine. All right. First of all, thanks again. This is a great opportunity to uh, talk about uh, uh, elder issues. I really respect and appreciate my can uh, fellow uh, candidates up here uh, for uh, obviously the, the, the decorum and also I think some really good uh, uh, potential solutions. I told you that I was gonna talk a little bit about something personally on my closing remarks. Something that really, what, what happened to me and what happened that's making me uh, you know, a, a tireless advocate, I really believe, certainly not in the level of Mariko Yamada, but I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, but let me just tell you, uh, 
and how senior issues can affect people overnight without even knowing it's you know it's going to happen. My mom was a 79 year old uh, woman that was living in uh, not assisted living, but just in a, 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 a senior citizen center, if you will. And uh, she was in great health, had been out, she drove her car, drove her car was out to lunch the, the day before. Came down, uh, uh, we know now, with a bladder infection the next day. And through an error from her, the place that she stayed, an error from the doctor, an error from the laboratory, um, they failed to recognize it was a bladder infection. In fact, there was no sample. The bottom line was, for three days, she sat in the hospital uh, with a bladder infection without treatment that caused a heart problem. M you know, moving on and on and on. So they finally figured out the problem and basically took care of, put her on medications and everything. And then she got C. diff. And I don't know if you understand what C. diff is. Uh, it's colon uh, bacteria that you can get in hospitals that's resistant to bacteria. And I'm telling you what, they have to be part of a family that went through uh, I think the uh, dignity issues that she, that she had to deal with, uh, a loss of dignity, and then when three weeks later she had been in the hospital, still no better, saying, I'm sorry, you know what? Your insurance is no longer, as a healthcare social worker had came in, and you know, this woman was just doing her job. But I'm sorry, uh, your mom's insurance doesn't cover this any, any longer. You're gonna have to take her to a skilled nursing facility. And you know, I knew what that meant. I really knew it that way. And uh, my wife and I took my mom home. We decided we were gonna do it that way. But you know what, my wife, we almost brought her back. And it, the, just the ugly facts about C. diff is, is it's, it, it's just so hard to, uh, you know, to get rid of. And on day eight, she got it. But this is something that I thought about. You know, I am a, an honorary trustee of the Queen of the Valley Hospital uh, board in, in Napa County. I'm a county supervisor with access to and supposedly all this knowledge and contacts with, you know, getting uh, things done. And here I couldn't do it for my mom. And I really look at that. I could not do what she needed for her. And so all of a sudden it brought to me, look at, look at all the people in our community that don't have any resources at all. They either don't have the money, they don't have the contacts, they don't know, they don't have the transportation. And what are they doing? And so, you know, it's, uh, we don't have her anymore. She lived a great life. But the reality is, is um, I am committed. This is something that is worthy of doing. I've seen what a loss of dignity had done to somebody that I love very, very much. And I, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. And so uh, I just pledged you, I, uh, uh, you know, I almost hate to do this after talking about, uh, you know, my mom, but you know, I've got 130, you know, endorsements from local elected officials, not just in Napa County, people that live in the district all throughout the six counties that we serve. Uh, you know, I've got the funds. I've worked really hard since July 8th when I got in the race to earn enough money, to raise enough money, to run a competitive campaign. Uh, I've got a work ethic that I believe is second to none, and I've got a passion to help people. And I hope that uh, my experience and often experience is underrated, but I've got, ex or overrated, I've got experience with accomplishments. And I'm not gonna go into them, you've got them down there, but I just really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to be able to address you and let you know a little bit more about me. And thank you uh, very much again to the Yolo County Aging Alliance. Thank you for putting this on, I appreciate your time. Next is uh, Mayor Joe Corposa. Well, uh, delighted to be here today. Thank you again very much to the uh, to the organizers. Uh, and boy, you know, two hours goes by awfully fast when you're enmeshed in such uh, tremendous issues. And and you know, really great thinking going on from the audience and up here uh, with my with my colleagues as well. Uh, I'm gonna add just a, a couple of points actually from uh, to to maybe add to some of the things that, that Peggy said at the at the very end that uh, I haven't touched upon yet. Uh, one of my most uh, kind of profound uh, experiences uh, was being a, a, a pretty bored uh, junior high school student who was also then honored for being the most outstanding student in the school. 
And I thought, well, that's kind of a little bit of a dichotomy, right? <laughs> and I had cousins who were attending a vocational uh, education school run by the Salesian Brothers in Rosemead, California. And I thought, you know, they're really getting empowered. They're really digging in. They're really excited about high school. And so I went off to Don Bosco Tech and I studied electronics. Uh, but I saw the power of vocational education. Uh, and uh, I think I bring a lot in education to this race from uh, being a community college trustee and serving in the California Student Aid Commission and uh, working at University of California. But uh, this area of senior care is absolutely an area that lends itself to a much, much more robust vocational education system uh, in the state of California. We have to train the workers. And so we all know the demographics. We've talked about it. We know that we're heading to a 2050 situation with uh, 20 to 25 percent of our population being uh, 65 or older and that means that this industry of caring for our seniors is is exploding and that means we're going to have to train the workers uh, whether we're talking about IHSS or smaller in-home care situations uh, and I would bring that experience as well. Uh, I'm very impressed here kind of with the ideas about enforcement right laws that are hollow uh, get us nowhere and uh, you know, as a, as a trained attorney, I would arrive at the legislature really thinking about how we protect those, uh, especially with the laws that we have, but if we need more laws, which we certainly do in this area, uh, then we would move forward in that, uh, that area as well. Uh, we're also in this incredible time of greater information sharing, right? Part of the consortium that you put together here in YOLO only happens because we can create web pages, we can communicate more freely, and we need to make sure that the state of California is that independent arbiter of great information that we can all use uh, to make the, the transportation, long-term care, uh, health care, and housing situation uh, decisions uh, they are going to carry uh, all of us uh, forward. I am running for this seat because I have been able to make a difference on so many large issues that have taken tough decision making in the city of Davis. Uh, I've been the mayor for over three years now and whether it's budget, whether it's labor, whether it's housing, whether it's transportation, it's just whether it's water, it's been one big thing after another where I've had to sit there with staff, with my colleague and figure out how to make the tough decisions. I look forward to taking that kind of ability to bring people together to make public and private uh, decisions come together for the betterment of the community. I want to bring that forward. The second thing I want to say about why I'm running is I love this district, and I know my colleagues do as well, but this is a really fantastic assembly district. This is ag and open space, and my environmental values that I think many of you know about match that. This is a great county in Yolo and in Napa that really roll up their sleeves on social services. Uh, we support the rural, supporting the urban, and the urban supporting the rural. That's very unique to have this great play back and forth uh, between our farmers markets and our access to food and all of these things. I know I match that well. And I work at UC. This district includes Sonoma State and four community colleges where I've been a community college trustee. The educational assets of this district and the ability to link them to everything we do is something that just makes me smile when I wake up. It would make me happy to go to work in the legislature and I know I could do a great job integrating that great educational infrastructure and all it brings from the UC and the Sac State students that are volunteering for YOLO Adult Day Health and here and so on. My campaign has over 600 individual donors. Over half of our donors have given $100 or less. Our dollar figure as well is somewhere between Mr. Wilkes and Mr. Uh, Dodds. Uh, we're a little closer to one side than the other. Uh, but I think I've had tremendous support. Uh, my list of supporters are the people that I've had an association with. The people on my overall list are people that one person at a time, I've built that list. I've served all of you. I'd like to ask for your vote for assembly, and I look forward to serving you in the future in the legislature as a great, great representative continuing the work of Mariko Yamada. Thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you Joe. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Dan Wolk. Well, thank you, Jim, and, and thank you to, to everybody, uh, certainly uh, for, for all you do. but coming out here and asking such great questions. It's been a great, great conversation. I appreciate my colleagues 
as well. And, and thank you specifically to the Yolo Healthy Aging Alliance and, and certainly Jim for moderating and, and Sheila Allen. Um, so I think as, as you've seen here uh, today is, is I think I present a, a bold vision as to what we need in our state. And that a lot of these issues really get at that, that real need to, to reinvest and that great amount of disinvestment that's occurred predating even the Great Recession. And it's really critical for our policymakers to, to initiate that reinvestment and to be willing to make those tough decisions to reinvest. And that's the vision that I present. And it goes all the way from, from you know, childhood, from universal preschool, <coughs> all the way up to, to these issues that we've talked about today, including uh, long-term care. So, uh, so basically, there, there, there are three reasons why, why I think I, why, why I would love your support. First is that vision that I present. Second is my experience, which has come through today. Um, I mean, I talked about the, uh, the legal clinic that I found, and I should note, Jimena Bustamante is here, and I didn't see her before, but she was also very active um, in the clinic's formation. Um, but uh, certainly on, on that level, as, as a private attorney, and certainly on the city council, where I've been since 2011, and have, have done a, a number of, uh, have, have been a real leader on a number of these issues, including water, and of course the cannery as we talked about. Uh, and then lastly is my experience as a county council for the last number of years at uh, Solano County, where I've really focused, uh, you know, certainly on the issues presented here tonight, but on a whole host of other issues, whether it's realignment or, or the Delta <coughs> or others. So, um, so vision, experience, and lastly is my clear ability to work with others, and that's really critical in the legislature. I think the ones who are successful, the ones who are able to work with others, and I think, you know, I have a number of endorsements from throughout the district. Uh, coming from, from folks who I know very, very well, but also folks who I only met in the last few months, you know, the school board members out of Rona Park, for example, or, or um, you know, city council members in, in Lake County who, who I've met with, talked with, talked about their issues, and they, they like what they're hearing and they endorse me. Uh, no other connections but, but really that, me going up there for a, for a weekend or multiple days and talking to them. And, and, um, and so a lot, a lot of these, uh, the folks um, who are supporting me are, are are, are supporting me for, for, for the vision I present and for, for uh, you know, the experience that I have and my ability to work with others. And I think my ability to work with others is really key here in Yolo County. And you'll see that all five members of our school board have endorsed me, but the other three members of the city council have endorsed me. Uh, our two supervisors, including Supervisor Prevent and Supervisor Sailor, have endorsed me. And it's clear that I have that ability to work with others. And that is a key part of the legislature. Um, but Bill is right when he talks about the, that importance of working with others. And, and that's the key to making legislation happen, not only with having that vision, not only having that experience, but having that ability to work with others. So uh, we're getting a lot of support. And what's key here, and this is the last thing, I know I'm much enough on time here, but the key here is we've had a strong advocate for these issues in the state capitol with Assemblymember Yamada. She's been excellent on these issues. She's been excellent on progressive issues in general, on democratic issues in general. And she has been strong. And we need a leader from this district who shares those, who is strong like her on those views. And that's, that's what I present. And we're getting a lot of supporters to, to see that. And, uh, and, um, and yeah, I would just really like your support. Thank you very much. <laughs> I would like to thank all three candidates for coming today and, and for running for office. We have a tradition of excellence uh, with our members of the legislature, and that tradition will be continued with any of the three of these candidates. We're very fortunate to have such good people uh, running for office. Uh, I would like to thank a few people. Again, the uh, YOLO Healthy Aging Alliance, uh, uh, Alliance Board of Directors, the In-Home Supportive Services Board of Directors for sponsoring the event, Palm Gardens uh, for providing the food, and, and there's plenty left. Feel free to take some before you leave. And also uh, Davis uh, Media Access. Uh, they're going to be providing cable and website uh, access to this event. So if you want to see it again or tell somebody who wasn't here, uh, it's going to be available. There is uh, candidate literature in the back. Uh, you can uh, uh, get more information there. And also an opportunity to meet uh, Congressman Garamendi on uh, Monday at noon, one, one o'clock, right here at the Davis Senior Center. He's coming to meet people, so uh, uh, feel free to show up and I'm sure he'll be happy to talk to you. But again, thank you very much to the candidates for coming and uh, presenting their views today. <laughs>